being his children. Now, everybody in here, you consider yourself a child of God, right? You consider yourself being, um, let me see, what's the word I want to use, Joe? Uh, approved by God. You consider yourself as uh, a person who God recognizes as his own. Okay? Well, I'm going to tell you, that is a great thing to do because, let me see here. Uh-oh. There we go. Uh, so we're going to talk about Jonah this morning. And when we talk about Jonah, we talk about Jonah and the big fish. Now, understand this about all Bible stories. What they are is information from God through the Holy Spirit about information he wants us to have. And what we're supposed to do is go into that story and extract how I can be a better person to serve God. That's what we're supposed to do. The other thing you never do when you do Bible study, you never study the Bible to fix somebody else. Your job is to fix you, make you be a better person using God's word. Brother Gates used to always tell me, don't, don't be studying to, to fix other people. You're the one that needs to be fixed. Fix you. Fix you. Okay. So next week, we're going to be talking about self-discipline that saved God's anointed. Self-discipline that saved God's anointed. We'll be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 1 through 24. And our core value for this month is new self-discipline. Well, new self-discipline uses the... the uh, Parallel or uses the, the uh, parable of the uh, ten, ten virgins. Whereas five were wise, all you need to know here, this whole parable, is that there's some foolish acts and there's some acts that are wise. Foolish people do not plan, they don't prepare, they don't make adjustments for what's coming up. And what happens when you're talking about something spiritual? God is saying, I'm coming back, but I won't tell you when. So it's up to you to prepare to live your life so that when I return, you won't have to go like the foolish virgins here. They had to go in and ask the wise one, will you give us some of your oil? No, I'm not going to give you any of my oil. You need to go buy some. And when they came back, the bridegroom was gone. He was gone. So it's up to you. It's up to us to focus in on what God wants us to do. So as we, after the, the new self-discipline, the core value says it is a discipline to do the things that I don't want to do. When they need to be done, even when I have to delay gratific immediate gratification to do them. So the whole focus of this, of this uh, core value is discipline. A lot of, I'm going to say people, but I'm going to use the term more, adults. Even though sometimes we are adults, we, we're not structured. We're not disciplined in how we live our lives. We have some gaps. Uh, and it's not, I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I'm saying the, la the best person you ought to know is you. You ought to know you better than anybody. So as the idea of new self-discipline, the focus is to, uh, re it reminds us about our responsibility to teach the gospel to the lost. It helps us to underst and understand and avoid fear-based excuses to stop us from teaching the gospel. And the Bible says that you invite, you, 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 excuse me, you reach, and you teach, not just invite. So the whole focus of God's children is to make disciples. Your objective is not just to get up in the morning. Now, I'm talking spiritually. Get up in the morning and go back to bed at night. What are you doing with those the time that God has given you? How are you trying to help somebody else find Christ? How are you trying to do that? What, what tactic, what strategy do you use to help somebody 
know God better. First part, now, if, if I said, if I asked that question, you know, for the answer, as a matter of fact, I'm going to ask, what's the strategy you use to try to help somebody else know God like you do? What's your strategy? Yes. Wait, 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 IG. And the reason we do this is because we want your remarks to be heard uh, online. And if you just, and when we don't talk, to the mic. Yeah, go ahead. First, you got to let your light shine and live a, a righteous life so other people can see you doing it. Because when you tell them about Christ, if you're not living right, they're going to look at you and say, you ain't doing what the Bible says. And that, that's a, that was going to be my first point. Where is your example to that person? Because the, the book that they're going to read, they may not ever open a Bible, but the book they're going to read is your life. They're going to read your actions. They're going to read your thought process. You know, uh, when my daughter, my oldest daughter, yeah, I'm going to have to say, baby, when she was getting ready to go to, go to college, I told her, uh, Proverbs 15.1. But I love you. What does Proverbs 15.1 say? Uh, wrath. Uh, soft answer. A soft answer. But? Grievous words stir up anger. So I wanted her to learn that in college because she did not have soft answers. <laughs> she didn't have so. I want to say to you, while you're in school, you learn how to give a soft answer. Doesn't mean you're a weak person. Makes you a disciplined person. Makes you a disciplined person. And, but, but if you want to use grievous words, you can use them. But they stir up anger. They stir up anger. So you got, to, as part of your example, how am I going to talk to people to be an example to them with my life. Yes. Go ahead. So kind of paid back on what uh, my sister said was people have to see the Bible. Even though they never read a scripture, if they see the Bible in you, then that will uh, make them inquisitive about what they need to do, especially when things going on at work. You know, when I've remained calm, people would say, how are you, why do you remain so calm? Why do you, you're not worried about being laid off? You're not worried about, so they have to see that, and then that kind of draws them to you, and then you kind of open up that discussion. So they will read your life. Read your life. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at Jonah, and we're going to ask Jonah some things about, you know, how, how did you make the decision you made to run from the presence of God? How do you make that kind of decision? I don't even know what that means, to run from the presence of God. First of all, how can you? How can you run from the presence of God? So that's not what you're thinking about? Okay. So let's talk. Let's go a little bit further. Uh, oops, I, I'm sorry. I didn't even touch that slide. Okay, you're a child of God, you have a DNA. God gave you his spirit. And in his spirit, what you're able to do, what, but he, that he put in you, he wants you to know, Isaiah says, your whole duty, your whole purpose in life is to glorify God. Every day you get up in the morning and every day you go to bed at night, that time should have been aimed at glorifying God. It should have been aimed at that. Then Solomon says, the whole duty of man is to do what? Fear God and keep his commandment. You don't have another thing to do in life but fear God and keep his commandment. That's, that's your purpose. So then, the ultimate idea then is that we learn how to glorify God in our lives. So in our 15 core values, what we try to do is to help us understand how we, we have spiritual redirection and how we have spiritual development. 
Well, in that redirect, re, in the redirection, the idea is for us to think different. See, it's hard for you to redirect your life if you continue to think the same way you've been thinking. The Bible says in Romans that I want you to do, what I want you to do is I want you to do not change yourselves to be like people of the world. What I want you to do is focus on being changed by a new way of thinking. So when you've accepted Christ, now it's like, how do I be? I got to have a new way of thinking. I know how I used to think over here, but now that I'm over here, I got to think different. I got to think different. Anybody got any thoughts? Uh, I will bring you the microphone. Uh, no thoughts? Well, let's keep going. So when you think different, you begin to mature. As you mature, you start to leave some old habits, leave an old lifestyle, and develop a new lifestyle, the lifestyle that God wanted you to have. So why do I do that? I do that so that I can change my thinking so I can change my living. Change my thinking so I can change my living. Now, a very mature person will recognize when they're not making any adjustments. Matter of fact, the, the two people that will know they're not making any adjustments is you and God. I'm living, I'm doing the same thing I've always done. Now, I may play games when I get to church, so people won't know one way or the other, but God knows. The, the stage that you're trying, that you're performing on is much bigger than we think. It's a stage where God sees all. It doesn't matter how you try to uh, be around other people. God sees. I, I, if I don't think like that, I'll think I'm getting by with something. I ain't getting by with nothing. I ain't getting by with a thing. Okay, let's look. So I just, I, I thought, sometimes I'll be searching in and I find different things. I, I just thought this was a good slide to, for you to see how the church, how the Bible and the church and the ark scripturally match up. It's not anything that somebody's trying to put over on you, but they scripturally match up with what God wants you, how he wants you to be. So let's see here. This reading is at the top it says, I don't even know what it says because I see it all the time, suggested reading for class. Now, personally, I love to have, when I go to Bible class, I don't ever want to just walk in class. What are we studying? What have I got a chance to read about? I, so we try to keep, you know how we don't like, we don't, we don't like to read too much? We try to keep the, the, what, the reading at one page. Just one page. Give me 20 minutes of your time. Read over next week's lesson. You let me know. I'll make sure you have a copy before you come to class next week. I'll email it to you or text it to you, whatever. But you'll have a, a copy of what we're going to study. So when you read that, now you understand, OK, now I can kind of see which direction the teacher is going to go. So if you let me know, this is over, I'll make sure you get a copy. Uh, so what I try to do is just go through and give you a summary. And the summary says, the Lord allowed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah disciplined himself to pray instead of feeling sorry for himself. He changed his mind and decided to make a new vow to God. So God commanded the fish to vomit Jonah on dry ground. From that point, Jonah did and as God had asked him to do. So I want you to understand that, first of all, you can't run from God's presence. You know, I'm going to say this because I may not get to it. Do you realize that when, you, when God asks you to do something, first of all, he's already equipped you to do it. You're already equipped. If he asks you to do something, you already have, it's well within what you can do. How do you know that? Because God won't 
ask you to do something that you can't do. He won't. So what we got to do, have to understand and learn, is if I've been asked to do it, I must be capable. I must be capable. If, if, if I, now all I got to do now is, is put, put it in action. Put it in action. Let's see here. So here's some thoughts. Before, now, this is what happens to us sometimes. You can read through it if you want to, but it says, before Jonah could relay God's message to the Ninevites, Jonah had to be broken. And sometimes we need to be broken before we can serve God the way he wants us to serve him. So Jonah now, he, he had a job to do, but he wasn't, he, he, he was prepared. No, let me see him there. He was equipped, got it already, because he was a prophet, but he didn't want to. How many times has God asked us to do things, and we don't want to do it? We don't want to do it. it, 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 and, it and I'm not saying that it's a situation among you. I'm just saying human nature, sometimes we just don't want to do something. And it doesn't matter who asks. I mean, my sister can ask. I don't want to do it. My brother can ask. I don't want to do it. My wife can ask. I don't want to do it. But the point is, when God asks, he's not asking you to do it with you having an option as to whether you do it or not. He's telling Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. And when you go, I, I'm not, that's not an option. Well, I, I don't want to go right now. No, you, I need you to go to Nineveh. They are wicked. Let me say something about God. God will always address wickedness, and he'll use his people to go through and take care of it. So sometimes you may be asked by God, uh, there's some wickedness going on. I need you to go take care of that. I'm not asking you to baptize nobody, but I am asking you to teach them. Okay? All right, let's see. Question, have you ever been broken by God? That's a personal question. Have you ever had a great fish moment with God? Where God has just took over and says, I know you don't want to do this, but now I'm going to have to fix you so that you recognize where I stand, where you and I work together. And sometimes we have God, we have moments like that. Let's go, let's look at a bit. Jonah, the word Jonah means dove. And the word amitai means truth. So it actually came out to where the, the rendering of Jonah's name was a morning dove, son of truth. Jonah, you know, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, all names had meanings. So you go and you find the meaning of that name, and now you understand, what did God? Jonah is a son of truth. Son of truth. So let's look a little bit further. See that thing about Facts about Jonah, now I'm not going to do this because it's just, uh, there's, there's a whole lot there, but I know I ain't got no time. Who's, who's watching my time? Nobody? Joseph, you got it. 9, 10, I got to be. 10, 10, there you go. I got to be coming, and then 10, 15, I have to be prayed up and out of here. Okay? All right. So. Look at this. Uh, here's the outline of Jonah. Jonah is a very short book. It's just four chapters. I colored those in blue so you couldn't see them right away. Now I'm gonna show them to you, but I I wanted I didn't want I wanted you to see Jonah now in the first chapter. Jonah is commissioned. Second chapter, Jonah prays. Second, third chapter, Jonah commissioned a second time, and the second, the third, last time is Jonah. But look at this. The first time Jonah is running from God, first chapter. In the second chapter, Jonah is running to God. So when I asked you all ago about your, your, your fish moment, because when you get to that fish, when we get to chapter 2, Jonah now, he starts to pray. Now, He's in the belly of the fish, praying to God. 
Can, can you can y'all can you wrap your mind around that? Because God says, I understand what you've done. I've got to, I'm going to send a fish to swallow you. And you're going to stay there three days. And while you're there, Jonah then decided to pray to God. I need help. So all of our prayers ought to be what? I need help. I need help. And I'm sorry. Any more comments? Hang on, Joe, uh, IG. Any comments? I know we got to have comments. There's no way, Brother Adam, just teach this class. Young lady, do you have another comment that we can have? Because nobody else is willing to say anything. So, uh, All right, let me go on. T? Okay, all right then. So, look at this. In this book, Christ and Jonah. Jonah's in the fish, the belly of the fish, for three days and three nights. And Jonah's, that is relative or that is anticipation of Christ going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And the salvation of the Ninevites has reference to the salvation that God has planned for his people today. So, again, uh, here, so I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to read this because I'm, oh, I might be. Okay. I just, who can read? Uh, let me hear the Craig read it. Yeah, Craig will read it for me. How you doing, sir? I'm good. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, lain down and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, how is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on the account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us for you. O oh Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the, uh, the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I know Craig didn't really volunteer to read all of that, but he's such a patient worker. He's easy to work with. Yeah. 
So I'm going to ask you to just recall some points as I go through the lesson itself. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as I go through the lesson, just recall some points. Okay. So Jonah, no, you don't, we're not going to read chapter 2. But here's the points I want to address this morning. Does God know God, what, what God recognized Jonah as his child? So I want you to understand that God knows them that are his. And you know, the Bible says God knows them that are his. What I want us to think about is, is there? Does God know me? Now, I know I'm sitting in Bible class, and I know I'm here to worship, but does he know me? Because I may be, what you call that? What's that word? I may be uh, doing some things or saying some things, but I'm not really living a Christian life. I'm just kind of where I'm supposed to be. Sunday says go to church, I go to church. But I'm not really focused on what God has asked me to do. So let's see. Recognition of God. The word came to Jonah. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 14 is about all you're going to get as it relates to Jonah and that he, because Jonah was a prophet of God. So he understood and he knew his responsibility. He just neglected to do what he was supposed to do. Now, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, anytime you got a point to make, Raise your hand, because I do not want this to be, uh, what, just me always talking? Because I know there's some good thoughts here. I guess I'm waiting. No, I was just standing there. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Based on how you live your life, what, no, I, I, put, I can't say you. Based on how I live my life, is there enough evidence to prove that I'm a child of God? Would God recognize me? Does he recognize me as his child? And that's got to be based on my lifestyle. How do I live? How do I talk? How do I act? What are the things that I say? Look here. Bible says, but the foundation of the Lord is laid solid. On it is written. Remember I told y'all, anytime you see on it is written, or it is written, I told you to go do what? Find out where it's written. Because the Bible don't just use terms. It, use, it says, if I was reading the King James, it says, for it is written. So I want you to go to tell me where it's written. Well, here, that the Lord knows his who his people are. Now, where that's written is in number 16, chapter verse 5, that God said, uh, he said to Korah and all of his followers, tomorrow morning the Lord will reveal who belongs to him and who is set apart. That's going to happen tomorrow morning. So God knew, and God was going to reveal. So if you, if you question God, God, has, God got an answer for you. God will give you information that you need to serve him, to serve him. But look at this. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says, if you belong to God, you've been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price. And what does that mean? I'm accountable to God, not to the eldership, not to the minister, not to my wife. There's a much higher ceiling. I'm accountable to God. Once I've embraced the teaching, once I've embraced the salvation, once I understand that, I, that uh, I've been bought with a price, I'm accountable to God. That, 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 ought, to, that ought to matter. Because now you're not look, just looking at another person. You're looking at the almighty. Because when I stand in judgment, uh, you know what Brother Adam's going to be doing? Standing right there too. And I'm going to be trying to get, make sure that I've been approved just like you're going to be trying to make sure you approve. Our job here is to, on earth is to help each other. Right? We ain't even trying to help each other go to heaven. That's what we ought to be trying to do. Uh, so let's see. 
Jonah, God calls Jonah. He tells Jonah, I want you to rise, and I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, I have go there because that was the commission that God gave Jonah. However, God gives us a commission uses the same word, go. And when, I, when you go, I want you to make disciples of men. Again, this is not optional. Look, all, with God, all of God's children are expected to make disciples. All of them. Even when you say, well, I don't know enough, then you need to learn. It's, it's, it's not something you can't. It's something you should do to please God. But then he turns around and he says, if God do this, God asks you, you are capable of doing because God will not hold you responsible for something you're not capable of doing. He won't do it. Question, thoughts. Uh, well, let me get to the last point. Running from our responsibilities doesn't change our responsibility. Only thing it ensures is consequences. Because that's just disobedience to God's will. That's the only thing that ensures. Now, comment. Now, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I just, maybe I just need to ask. But I think it's important in Bible class that the class participates and talks and helps, you know, to direct the discussion so that we are always, it's not just the teachers up there. He's just guiding the discussion. That's all he's doing. And some of you all are much better at saying the same thing, just put it in a different way. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll keep going. Nobody wants to say Joe, so I'll keep three minutes. I, I, want, I want you to go to Nineveh because they're a wicked city. And I don't want you to just go. I need for you to preach to them. And you're going to become a fisherman. Y'all remember last week we talked about Peter and God told him, I'm going to make you fishermen of men. Well, that's all Jonah's doing. God is asking him, you know, I need for you to go, Elmer. I need you to go and recognize that Nineveh needs help in conversion. That's what I want you to do. All right. Uh, Nineveh was depicted as an uh, of the Assyrian Empire for enemies of God. They were not people, they were cruel people. Uh, and, and, and Jonah knew this. Uh, it was not their cruelty and for their idolatry. But, and so Nineveh now is, I mean, excuse me, Jonah doesn't want to go. Any other Bible story you can think of. No, I'll tell you what I thought of. You remember when God told Peter and God told uh, Ananias, I need you to go talk to Saul. And then I said, whoa, that guy has done lots of bad things. I'm not sure that I need to go to him. He's done this. And the Bible says, and he even said, even him now, he's got authority from the high priest to bind all those who invoke your name. Now, Ananias is talking to Christ. I know what you're talking about, but go. That's it. All right. Uh, see, I ain't getting nowhere. I ain't getting me. All right. So let me, let, me, let me try to get a couple of pieces here. First of all, where are you going if you leave God? If I go here, you're there. If I go here, you're there. If I go over here, you're there. Where am I going? You can't leave God's presence. 
Anywhere you go, look here. I was a prophet, so he should have. And I'm, I'm, uh, excuse me. Jonah, uh, people look to him for leadership. People look to us for, to be examples in how we live. And look to us to be examples. How can we? Be an example to somebody if we're not. If there's no evidence of our own individual commitment to God. We've got to be committed to serving God. All right, I'm going to, uh, all right, I'm going to show you this. I ain't going to say nothing about it. God's attributes, he's all powerful. He's everywhere at once. He's all knowing. He's sovereign. His, his providence works, and he knows your heart. Understand this about God. No matter how much you try to fool somebody, God knows your heart. I don't know it, and you don't know mine, but i tell you who does, and that's God. No matter how you think, you may say this or not say this about even your parents, but God knows about your wife. God knows, and you will stand in judgment, and you will give an answer to God for what you've done in this life. All right, so um, I have no time, and we have our, uh, something wrong with my watch. Uh, yeah, I probably get me another one. But this whole, the whole lesson is about recognize that you can't, and when God asks you to do something, do what he asks. You are equipped. You are capable to do what he's asked you to do. Don't run from him. Matter of fact, where are you going? Where are you going? All right, so next week, we're going to talk about 1 Samuel chapter 26, uh, verses 1 through, was it 1 through 24? Now, I showed y'all that slide at the beginning. Yes, it was, 1 through 24. But we're going to talk about God's anointed has his life saved because of his discipline. Because of his discipline. So, appreciate all of you for being in class. And uh, so we're going to have a dismissal prayer. And those of you who want uh, refreshments, go over there and you can get you some refreshments. Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be here this morning to talk about your will, to talk about your way, to talk about how best we can serve you with every fiber of our being. Help us, God, to be children who are obedient, and who want to serve you with everything we do. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glad to see you.